Curious Cats of All Stripes, I'm Oliver Perrin for Semiagog, and tonight the subject will again be Esoterica. To be more specific, we're going to talk about a very useful technique for developing new insights, uh, for learning more about our behaviors uh, and motivations, for research, for therapeutic purposes, and uh, even for the process of composition. You can think of it as a way to gain access to memories, understandings, uh, mental processes, and inspirations that might otherwise remain locked away beyond our conscious awareness. So without further ado, let's jump right to it. Now there are two main issues here. Uh, the first is obtaining or acquiring things to think about, and the second is uh, thinking about them in new or um, previously unused ways, ways that are arguably more effective than those that have been drilled into us by habit, uh, drilled into us by piss-poor education, uh, by lazy minds teaching bored children, um, minds unwilling or unable to identify or foster new thought ways. In many ways, this is about inspiration, uh, composition in a very broad sense. This is about a creative process. But bear in mind my previous remarks about how we overlook important things, um, esoteric things that hide in plain sight. How many of us have ever given real thought to what composition really is, what inspiration really is, what invention really is? The last two terms, inspiration and invention, both provide clues if we'll bother to uh, consider them. Both, in their uh, semantic origins, refer to a kind of incoming breath or spiritus, an invisible thing that comes into us and brings with it new knowledge or understanding. The technique we'll now discuss is all about making that process less invisible. But let's, uh, let's set that aside for the moment. Let's, uh, let's take a look at what comes to mind when most people think about composition or, um, or inspiration. A common scene that we used to see in movies uh, and in, uh, in TV shows was the writer sitting down in front of a typewriter with a, a blank sheet of paper, frustrated by uh, his inability to get started. Now, this usually included a wastebasket full of crumpled up, uh, discarded pieces of paper, each of which amounted to a false start or an unsuccessful attempt. These days, things have changed, but not much. Many of us will still sit down in front of a computer, looking at a blank screen, waiting for the words to come. But this simply isn't how it all works in reality. Or I should say that this is not how it usually works. The idea that you just sit there until it happens is nonsense. It bears no relation to the, uh, the reality of composition. That's why uh, Nietzsche, to take an example, composed his books while hiking. He then made notes and then later assembled them into books. And then he wrote the books. Now, in the case of the typewriter uh, and the blank page, or uh, the computer I just mentioned with the blank screen, there's one important aspect that's shared, and that is linear sequence. The technique I'm going to share with you allows you to escape from precisely that constricting linear sequence. Everyone likes to talk about thinking outside the box, only to then try to think within something far more constraining and restricting a two-dimensional line. So we have to escape from the line. And we have to get past this idea of staring at nothing, at a blank white page or screen, and expecting to be inspired. Successful writers know that actually writing down your thoughts or your ideas or whatever it is in a complete sequence is the last thing that happens. It comes at the end of all sorts of other things that nobody talks about, even in so-called 
writing courses in school. So here is the technique. Here is the way to get around all of this. And as I will explain, it has to do with a lot more than just writing and uh, composition as it's generally understood. As I said, this clip will be about esoterica. This is not going to be a clip on creative writing, so bear with me. First off, if you want to check out this uh, technique, you should obtain index cards. I like to use them in uh, several sizes. I also like to use them in various colors, but for now it's enough to have cards. You definitely should not be using uh, a bound journal because a bound journal has pages and these pages impose a sequence that brings us back to the line. And again, we want to escape from the line, from the sequence. The standard journal is useful uh, and it definitely has its place. I'm not saying anything bad about it, but its place is not here. Anyway, get yourself, um, get yourself some index cards. Uh, I like small ones because I can carry a few of them with me uh, as well as a pen. The important thing is to always have some cards and a pen with you. Once you have that taken care of, all you need to do is stay alert to any new ideas, any new phrases, thoughts, or expressions that come into your mind. You have to be very sensitive to maintain an awareness of anything that might rise to your conscious awareness. And as soon as something new or uh, interesting does appear in your mind, write it down on the card. Now, keep it as brief uh, as you can without losing any essential features of the thought. I also like to add the date, you know, as a little note on the bottom of the card. Uh, sometimes I add details about where I was when the thought came to me. If you're out and about when an idea comes to you, just write it down on the card and stash the card for later, you know, somewhere where you won't lose it. Pocket, uh, handbag if you're a woman, um, backpack, I don't know. Anyway, put it somewhere until you get home. Now, uh, I have a box that I uh, put all my cards in when I get home. It sits on my desk. I just go through each day, writing down what occurs to me, and then I put it into the box when I get home. And I leave the cards there for a while with all the others that I have. There's a bit more to it than this. Um, but before, uh, before we get into all of that, I need to emphasize two critical aspects of this technique. The first is that you have to work to intentionally become and intentionally remain sensitive to the arrival or appearance of incoming thoughts or notions. It's not enough to carry some cards and a pen with you. You have to develop some receptivity towards incoming ideas. You have to be willing and able to listen for these things when they emerge from within, wherever it is that they come from. That's, a, that's another uh, discussion entirely. And then, obviously, you have to be consistent about writing them down as quickly as you can. If I wait even a few minutes, uh, I've often found that I've forgotten what I wanted to capture in writing. So do it quickly. When the idea comes to you, take out your pen, get your card, capture the concept, be done with it. Stash the card for later. Rinse and repeat. The second point that I want to emphasize is that you should just capture the thought. Don't get into uh, exploring it. Don't, um, don't get into trying to unpack it in detail, at least not yet. If you have further thoughts at a later time and you think that they might be related to an earlier note, do not uh, put them on the same card. Put the new thoughts on a new card and stick them in the pile or uh, put them in the box or whatever. The key here is to try to capture the ideas as they come to you. If they come with uh, an interval in between, then put them on different cards. You'll see why in just a bit. Now, I usually allow my cards to accumulate for about a month. Uh, at the end of the day, I might have half a dozen or uh, a dozen notes on cards. I mean, sometimes if I'm really working on something heavy, there'll be um, quite a few more, but on a typical day, I don't know, six, 12 uh, note cards with my little ideas on them that have come to me at various times. Now, by the end of the month, 
I'll have uh, quite a few in my pile or stashed away in my box. When I've got enough of them accumulated, I'll wait for a day when I feel receptive, when I feel open and clear headed, and then I'll set aside some time to go through them. Uh, for this part of the process, you will also need a cork board, like the one you can see behind me, if any of you have ever been wondering what the hell it's for. Or if you prefer, you can use a uh, magnetic board with, uh, with magnets. I'd like to get one. I'd like to get a nice big one that's a dry erase board and it has magnets, but they're a little bit pricey, so I have not done it yet. I will shortly. Um, the magnets are even better than the uh, cork board. As a matter of fact, I think they'd be ideal. Um, but again, it's a little bit expensive, um, mainly because uh, what I'm recommending here requires a large board. You don't want a tiny one. Um, in the past, when I was low on money, I would just go to a Home Depot or a Lowe's or whatever, and I would buy a four by six sheet of styrofoam insulation, and then I would use thumbtacks on it. The insulation sheets can be uh, useful because they're light and easy to move around the room. The only problem is that the tacks usually don't stick very well. Uh, but you have to work within your means, so I present it as an option for those who might be operating on an already tight budget. I've been there. <laughs> Hell, with the uh, up and down roller coaster ride of my life, there's every chance I'll be there again soon. So, it's important to bear in mind that you don't want a tiny uh, cork board. Uh, or dry erase board or whatever. It has to be big enough that you have room to move things around on it. It has to be large enough that you can create groupings, uh, clusters, and sequences of cards. I really wouldn't use anything smaller than the, uh, than the board you see behind me. I'm not sure what its exact dimensions are. If I had to guess, it's like three and a half feet by five feet. And in any case, bigger is better. So moving right along with the rest of uh, this technique, whenever you're feeling like your head is in the right space, and this is important, uh, when you have enough time to focus and when you have a quiet spot to do it, pull out your cards. I like to sit in front of the board. As you can see uh, behind me, I have a desk in front of it. So I have a workspace in front of the area where I will be putting the cards up. Um, if you don't have a desk like this, uh, you can always lean your board or cork board, insulation panel, dry erase board or whatever. You can lean it up against the wall um, or whatever is there in your room and sit on the floor. Pull out all of your uh, cards that you've accumulated and go through them, sorting them into piles based on any relationships that you can discern, based on any criteria you think is appropriate. It's up to you. You are the one uh, who will find the connections in these things because you yourself have produced them. Now for me, because I write, because I research, uh, because I'm into poetry, I'll usually find that for me I get groups of phrases um, and expressions. These are just as much about how to say something as they are about what's being said. By this I mean I get um, a, a specific expression. It's a particular way of wording something. Um, and I capture it because, you know, I, I, I'm interested in thoughts, but I'm also interested in a clever turn of phrase or a compact or a economical way of saying something. I'll also often have some uh, cards that uh, apply to things I'm researching, like uh, why and how humans place marks on objects or how uh, chemical communication affects relationships or whatever. And I'll have cards on which I've written down personal insights also about what's making me confident uh, or depressed, um, anxious, hopeful, cheerful, whatever. So there's, you know, aspects that might relate to poetry, phrasing, turns of phrase, things about um, research and things that I'm studying, personal insights. And that's what I mean when I say look for um, how these cards can be grouped into categories. I then take these groups and put them up on my board. I cluster them together. Now, here's where it gets interesting. 
Remember what I said about escaping the, uh, the evil line, uh, the sequence? This is what the board is for. You've got a much bigger, freer, open, two-dimensional space to play around in. Um, you can use it to lay out rings, uh, you know, circular arrangements of cards, if you find that you've got concepts that kind of come back to where they started in some sense. Um, you can use it to lay out radiating spokes, uh, tree diagrams, whatever kind of arrangement uh, you feel appropriate to understanding uh, some relationship that you can discern in what is on all these notes that you've collected. You can even go back to a linear sequence if it turns out that that is appropriate. God help you. Uh, when I do this, when I lay these cards out in various ways on the board, I can see how, or often see, how things are interrelated. And I'll frequently see how what I thought was just one group will actually break out into uh, further subgroups. Furthermore, if I've uh, put dates on my cards, as I mentioned earlier, I can always um, establish a temporal sequence if that becomes useful or necessary, or I can cross-reference um, the notes that I have on cards with uh, a particular day in the record of my standard journal. Most of you uh, know that I discussed journals elsewhere in a previous clip entitled Write Yourself Down. The application of all of this to the process of literary composition should be obvious, whether we're talking about research papers, poems, stories, or screenplays. But it's at least as useful, if not much more so, for developing self-knowledge. In the course of reviewing these cards, you have the opportunity to look at all of the things that have occurred to you, and all of these subtle and, uh, and tiny ways over the course of a month or whatever interval of time has passed since you began collecting this latest group of cards that you're laying out. You have the opportunity, in short, not only to foster the birth of new ideas and awareness, but also to learn more about how that happens, to learn about how to do it more effectively, to learn more about how to amplify the natural creative process of insight. So here are a few photos of one of my board assemblies, one of the uh, examples of uh, how I've laid these cards out in the past. Now what you're looking at here are cards that I was using at the time to explore how human beings use non-linguistic marks to organize their behavior, just like animals in the wild with their territorial marks and resource marks and with marking behavior in general. But you could just as easily apply this to trying to understand why a relationship seems to be going to shit or to understand a phobia or, or even an irrational attraction. And these examples just scratch the surface of the various ways that these uh, techniques or this technique can be applied. Another thing that you should bear in mind is that the more space you have, the better. And I don't just mean space on the board. I also mean space in the room. This technique is all about perspective. You gain perspective by reviewing seemingly disconnected thoughts captured across time. You gain perspective by escaping the tyranny of the linear sequence that cannot be sidestepped when writing on a computer or in a journal, or God help you with a fucking smartphone. But you can also get perspective by physically backing up from your board, by seeing the whole rather than focusing just on parts, literally backing up from the material, as in getting it down to a smaller size in your field of vision by standing further away so that you can see all of it at once from a distance. Before I wrap this up, I want to emphasize again that this is uh, it's not just about composition or note taking. It's about gaining insights into how thoughts come to you. In the course of using this technique over many years, one of the most impressive things I've observed about it is the way it can help you to see connections that you would otherwise miss. 
because it involves capturing thoughts and reviewing them after the passage of time and reviewing them in ways that allow you to group the ideas or thoughts in freeform clusters, it's really kind of ideal as a tool to uh, facilitate bringing unconscious things to light. On some occasions, this method has shown me how ideas that I thought were unrelated were actually closely related, but I had not realized it yet because I had not looked at the entire output of my unconscious across a given period as a whole that I could arrange in a variety of ways. It allowed me to see how my unconscious, by sending forth these brief ideas here and there uh, in the course of a day and across periods of weeks uh, or months or years, how my unconscious is actually trying to draw my attention to some larger awareness that I'd not yet been willing or able to see. In this respect, it has a lot in common with keeping a dream journal, in the sense that once your subconscious realizes, once that deeper part of you, however you wish to define it, um, superconscious, subconscious, soul, spirit, whatever, once it realizes that you're giving it attention, that you're opening yourself up to communication from within, it will open up and begin to flow more freely, more quickly, more productively, which is to say, more meaningfully. I'm convinced that anyone who really bothers to experiment with this technique will discover ample proof of its effectiveness and doubtless find ways it can be applied that have not yet even occurred to me. For those who don't think it's esoteric enough to qualify as esoterica, all I can say is, try it. If you devote the necessary time and attention to it, all sorts of aspects will become clearer to you. If you're attentive, and if you keep at it, you might just notice ways in which your mind works on things outside of your conscious awareness. And in doing so, your conscious and unconscious minds, your intellect and intuition, become more integrated. The border between them becomes less of a sharp line and more of a field or a, a zone. Or perhaps I should say you come to recognize that there's never been a sharp border between the unconscious and the conscious at all. So that is it for this clip. Um, there will be much more to come. I should also let you know that Tim Rudisill has graciously uh, agreed to discuss esoteric subjects in future episodes. I'll be keeping those clips under the uh, chain smoke heading that you guys are aware of, but I'll be adding a little ezo tag to those titles. I'll be posting uh, two clips of this sort very soon, but I should warn you in advance. Uh, bring an extra pair of sneakers and a sack lunch because Tim ranges far and wide. He takes what he calls psychocartography rather seriously. Anyway, I expect many of you will find it rather interesting. Stay tuned for more, and don't forget to make sure that you are still subscribed and uh, set up for notifications, if you care to be, of course. Uh, I've gotten further messages from uh, subscribers. I told you about this before, but it is still happening. Uh, they've complained that um, they're not getting notifications. So I don't know. It's a, another YouTube screw up. So check it out. Make sure you're subscribed if you want to be, uh, just so that you do get notifications because it's continuing to be kind of haywire. Last but not least, a heartfelt thank you to all my subscribers and patrons. It's an uphill battle gaining exposure, uh, especially against the headwinds of the current YouTube algorithms. You early adopters continue to provide encouragement and to help me maintain my resolve to continue doing what I think we should all be doing, and that is speaking our minds. Get it? Got it? Good. Semi-agog, out.